All right. Um, so hey yo guys, hey yo, welcome to the first ever Blessed Dark Lounge. Um, so this is a live unfiltered chat, unlike anything I've ever done on YouTube before, because usually we go for pre-recorded stuff which I edit and then I put forward. But on this show, I want to do something different. Where uh, one, I want to discuss um, all of the current things that are going on in architecture. Obviously, make it a kind of a talk show. Where people can come in and uh, sort of chime into the news of the month, so to say. And uh, the best thing about it is that it's live. So uh, our thoughts would be unfiltered. We would really, um, you know, uh, be engaged in the conversation and 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 speak our minds, so to say. Uh, sorry for the 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 technical stuff that was happening <laughs> right before. And today on this channel, uh, I have with me Viviano. So, uh, yeah, uh, guys, can you hear Viviano as well? Testing one, two, three. Hopefully, they can. All right. I hope so. <laughs> hey, Rishab, it's great to be here with you, and you do a wonderful job of editing all the videos in your channel. An extremely good job. Um, but I, I agree with you that it's, there's nothing like live and unscripted uh, discussions. True. And I also shy away from them because I like to edit a lot <laughs> and sort of go. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think a lot on the editing table, especially for a lot of videos that I do. But obviously conversations are different uh, here. You know, you get the real feel and also you get to connect with the audience in real time. And that is why I want to do a live. Is because uh, even though we do a lot of pre-recorded interviews with loads of people around the world, it's just me and that person. It's not an audience with that, uh, and so that is why this was extra special. Yeah, and I think I really enjoyed that first video that we did, which was pretty long. No, how long was that discussion? It was over an hour, no? The very first one, it was. Yeah. I think an hour and a half. Yeah, ninety minutes. Yeah, which we did, and it it wasn't even all of it. We discussed a lot. Even within that, I think we touched upon in that discussion a couple of topics that, that we can talk about today. So yeah, I think you had an idea of what we could discuss today in, in this live session. Yes. So, but before we get into our major topics of discussion, I quickly wanted to discuss the news um, that went on in the architecture world in the world of uh, in the month of March. So um, we have our first segment, which is the news of the month. And let me just give me a second, guys. I will quickly adjust Viviano to fit the screen. This is like when you are on the jury and <laughs> changing things in front of them, <laughs> in front of the final juror. Making modifications to the model last minute. Yeah, like this wasn't supposed to be here. That looks good. All right. So because this was my first time doing it, I was sort of figuring out how to do things. But yeah. All right. So the very first thing that I want to talk about uh, is uh, today is 1st of April, obviously. Uh, a lot of people know it as April Fool's Day, but today was also the day that Laurie Baker died back in 2007. So I wanted to start off with just acknowledging that and just uh, talking about him for a second. And um, so I'll just quickly pull up his biography. So, um, Laurie Baker, for those of you who do not know, his full name was Lawrence Wilfred Baker and he was a British-born Indian architect, renowned for his initiatives in cost-effective, energy-efficient architecture and designs that maximize space, ventilation and light. Um, he really loved experimenting with building materials, although brick was his favourite and he had quite an aesthetic sense of how to build effectively and beautifully uh, with brick. So I wanted to also quickly share this quote by him. Uh, all, all of his quotes were actually, we hear a lot of philosophical quotes from architects. His were always talking about materials, about clients, about people and their homes. So um, here he talks about there is no need to cover them and them here is building materials over with costly finishes let a brick wall look like a brick wall and a stone wall should look like a stone wall um, concrete should look like concrete and not be plastered or painted to look uh, like marble 
when i read this quote it also took me back to architecture school when we were studying i think the seven lamps of architecture and we studied truth in that which talked about the truth of the material and we had studied loads of structures that actually uh, showcase the material that were used not only uh, in the final product but you know during what, every product that was used within the construction process also so that was very fascinating to look at um do you like i know he's an indian architect but have you heard of him before i had not heard of him before but i just pulled up some of his projects now that you just mentioned him because this is this was a surprise for me because we did say this is an unscripted discussion yeah uh, however from this quote that you that you pull up um it reminds me also of the lectures by khan louis khan and that you know that famous quote that that was taken from one of his seminars that it was then used in a movie um with i forget the name of the actor but he's the guy that hits in the hunger games and the quote is a brick wants to be a brick and you ask brick what do you want brick and brick says i want an arch and he says look arches are expensive why don't we use a concrete dental and brick says i want an arch cuz that's what that unit of construction was designed for and invented for originally to be able to create these sort of surfaces that are load bearing yeah um and when you puncture that surface then you need to deal with how to puncture it and of course the best ways actually arches and domes and these kind of things and and the evolution of the material and using it in a in an honest way of course what uh Mr Baker here is referring to is that we then hide the structure and we actually have to say in spanish we say a parent concrete for what is sometimes another place called fair face concrete or architectural concrete or bare concrete it's just concrete the thing is that we're used to using it and then covering, covering it, it with finish yep. so one of the one of the most important uh, aspects of a final construction document set is the finishes so it's covering all the structures all the masonry with the final finish plaster or, or marble etc now in some in some points the finishes are important because they're meant to then protect the structure because yeah. otherwise humidity water gets into it and then it doesn't last and so the finishes like marble are hard or hardened and protected paint is a finish that protects steel from weathering etc no but many times we use these finishes in a fake way so i think that's a very important thing to always kind of reconnect with the idea that materials need to show their nature um so, and also their weatherings concrete will get white from the salts and the minerals that are in there and will come out cork and steel will turn dark and you know sink panels will turn will, will turn green as they oxidize and they look beautiful that's yeah. the word you know, it's no? like they, the, they the building ages uh exactly yeah great in, in a planned way in an intentional way because as architects we need to know what's going to happen to that material in 50 60 100 years from now True. not just when True. it's new and we take our nice photos for our magazines and publications so lori baker was also so he did a lot in low cost architecture and mm -hmm. most of it was with it was uh done because of his knowledge of structures his knowledge of uh materials and so he mostly always worked with materials that were easy to procure just from your surroundings and using those he created forms that you would not regularly see uh, he a lot of his buildings had curves and when you're making curves with bricks it becomes a little difficult but all of his buildings use that aesthetic and uh, uh, still use the materials that were uh, available just nearby to bring in both a sense of design and an aesthetic design and a sense of sustainability to the structure so every time we we ever had a project on low cost architecture anybody does in india the first person we refer to is lori baker and his work yeah i mean from a very sort of superficial uh, perspective of not knowing uh, integrally his work i see this sort of smart allocation of not only materials but also building forms um i i do see neclectic a uh, amount of work where he exper we experimenting with what he can do with those materials um it reminds me a little bit of gaudi some of these buildings and some of these architects that are more around around the phenomenological idea or aspect of what the spaces can create more than having a formal aesthetic like if you would look at 
Corbu or frankly Wright, where you yeah. immediately can see what they're trying to go for. You can see here a material exploration. Yeah. All right. So from here, coming to our next news of the day uh, is Zaha Hadid. So I also wanted to, because you're also acknowledging the death anniversary of Laurie Baker, which is today. Zaha Hadid's death anniversary was uh, yesterday. So 31st of March. So um, uh, she died on 31st of March 2016. And again, I wanted to take a moment to sort of acknowledge uh, her as well. And quickly go through also like a quick exercise. Uh, are you one? Do you like Zaha Hadid structures? Well, we, we have a podcast in Spanish for all your bilingual um, viewers. And I, I love Zaha. I love Zaha's work. But I am also uh, hesitant of it. In, in our podcast, where we devoted almost two hours to her, my colleague, uh, who comes from, from the philosophy side, he's not really an architect, but he teaches uh, in architecture school. He says that Saha is the architecture of uh, enchantment, but also the architecture of temptation, because the curve is, is a big temptation. But when we talk about Saha, especially in, in academic settings, you know, if you take a year one student and you introduce that student to Saha, you have to be very careful yeah. because we have to understand the evolution of Saha. Saha did not start with curves. Eventually, she found the idea of the curve and really ran with it and, and used the computer for that. So actually, if you look at the evolution of Zaha, it's quite beautiful oeuvre of work, let's say. I, I've had the luck of visiting several of her buildings. Which one would you say is your favorite? Like, uh, if I had to choose Maxi. Maxi. The Maxi in Rome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in Rome and I had not gone to Maxi. So I want to go to Rome again so I can visit Maxi. Yeah. I'm going to be in Rome in, in July with my students. I, I will most probably be next year. So I, I'll also reach out to you for this if you want to come. For the Venice Biennale. And yep. similar to how we went to Dubai. Uh, yes. Like with Mateus and Max. Like I want to reach out to more people for Venice Biennale. Like let's just meet up in Venice. And then from there, I would also find my way to Rome. We need to do it the same way you did in Dubai for the Vernissage. So for the press opening. Yeah. Sounds fantastic. All right. So, um, speaking of Zaha, going to Zaha Hadid Architects. Um, so, ZHA has formally announced it's building a virtual city for the metaverse. And let me just quickly uh, read something for it. Uh, the city will feature ZHA's signature style in the form of city hall, collaborative working spaces, and even galleries selling NFTs. So they, they, yeah. So here is a quote from Patrick, which says, the time is ripe technologically, economically, and socially for shifting more and more of our productive lives into the metaverse. The metaverse is just starting to show its potential to empower true global collaboration with global uh, borderless participation. So Patrick, by the way, if you go to his Facebook page, nowadays he's talking a lot about Metaverse and hopefully I'll get him on the channel soon as well. So, uh, you know, uh, what, where do you stand on this whole uh, Metaverse when we talk about it? I want to get more and more into it. Uh, uh, my stance is one of curiosity, um, but I don't have a particular stance uh, we were talking before we started the recording, I think before we started recording, <laughs> uh, you had a discussion that was geared to, you know, the death of architecture itself. And I don't know if it has to do with it moving into the digital space. I think in the end of the day, we're, just, we're always going to need a physical space to inhabit our bodies. Yeah, I do think it, we're, we're look at the beginning stages of this, but I'm a little bit hesitant because I remember when uh, this this um, it was not a game, but this digital space was called a next, uh, the other life or a next life or afterlife. Second like that, life. Would, second life. Yeah. Where you had your avatar and you would go to all these spaces. And I think it's still there. And I got really excited. I was fairly, I was still in my teens, I think. So I was quite a long time ago. I also played ago. it, I think. I did. But the bandwidth was not there. And you, so there was a lack of users for that to be able to come alive, really. So I'm really interested. I'm really curious. I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. Now, you know, you say Patrick and I have to smile because Patrick is quite a character. So, 
You know, Patrick says a lot of things. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. I also wanted to quickly also show some uh, visuals of this this upcoming uh, new city within the metaverse. So I think the lower, the upper thing that you see is their city hall that they were sort of designing, and the lower is a gallery for NFTs. Um, so. Sorry, this is a Zaha design building for the metaverse. Yeah. So okay, so I have one question. Just it has no answer. But why do you need structure in the metaverse? Why lot, do you need? A lot of people even ask, why do you need gravity in the metaverse? Why is everything yeah. on the ground? Like right. it could just be. Uh, I think for and especially at this stage of the metaverse and trying to build these virtual worlds, people are just creating something that people can be familiar with and so make that transition into something virtual and mm. then slowly I think it'll go nuts where you can do and so I I got the VR headset the oculus and there's this game called VR echo uh, which is uh, an anti-gravity game so you you actually uh, it you fly around and you pull yourself mm. with with whatever you can catch and stuff like that. So it vibrates. It gives you all those sensations as if you're on anti-gravity. And after I take, so after I play for 20 minutes and I take it off, it feels weird with my original hands because it shows. Right. You, yeah. So. No, it, I I get it. You get used to it, and so you're unbalanced. Your whole bearings change, right? Yeah. So I mean, I think more and more in the future, then it would turn to those technologies where. Um, it would feel that that sense of being out of your world would be even greater. Uh, I don't know if it's a good thing, but I think it, it is going to be something that will um, just like the phone, there will be gadgets that will help you experience uh, uh, a reality that is beyond your, your physical one. Yeah, but remember Google Glass, for example, we all thought we would be using Google Glass 20 years ago. Right? Yeah. Where, where has last gone it was weird thing there's sometimes weird psychological or social things because i think the reaction was it was weird to have that on your face i always am reminded me by this re reminded by this book that my grandfather gave me uh, he gave it to me maybe in the early 2000s maybe 2001 2002 it was called your space flight manual and it was the idea that you would be going into space for holidays and you would take instead of a plane you would take a space plane and you would go to a hotel and these hotels are satellites and because there's low gravity there would be very interesting spaces where you can a pool in, in in low gravity not zero gravity you could grab water like a blob and throw it to someone because the the building is constantly rotating it's creating some sort of gravity and it was really interesting but the dates on this thing it was it said it was by 2020 you would be doing this uh and now we see a couple of billionaires now starting this program but you know as humans, sometimes there's very fast adaptation to new technology, yeah. and sometimes yeah. it's very slow. So my stance is I'm very curious about it. I'm super interesting. I think it's much more of a business case than a cultural case, but I'm curious. Yeah, till now we, we've only seen it mostly in, in entertainment or gaming. Um, so moving forward, our last quick news for the day is that Expo 2020 officially came to an end uh, yesterday. So yesterday was the, the last uh, day I was really I we were I, we were texting me Mateus and Max like we should have been there like for the end <laughs> uh, it would have been an amazing because even when we were there in the middle it was amazing the the ceremonies the fireworks so it would have been even greater uh, on its last day did you go to the expo no but you know I should have texted you one of my friends was there uh, my photographer uh, the guy who does all the photography of our work. Uh, Francisco, call him Paco, Paco Alvarez from, if anybody wants to follow them, uh, it's called The Raws, The under slash Raws. He was there documenting, invited by the people from, from the expo, but I wasn't able to make it. Unfortunately, it was, I, had a, it I had a conference in Argentina that it was my first back in in-person conference. Ah. Like, so even because of COVID situation, we we were originally scheduled to go in November. It got pushed to December, then January, February, and finally we were like we have to go in March because it's ending after that. 
so we we finally made it work but it was it was quite amazing to be in that space and i had originally thought that all world expos are sort of at this scale but i soon came to realize that they're not like dubai spent a lot and created uh like this whole city again in the middle of the desert uh how many pavilions were there in total uh was well, so had a map with all the pavilions no so the the pavilions in total were like 200 something if i'm not wrong but the thing wow. is not all of them were made by the country so some of them were made by the countries and those were the major pavilions and then most of the pavilions for the smaller countries were just made in these buildings that were made by the expo so this whole site would get converted into uh, like an office Uh, entertainment space and so those buildings where the small pavilions were they'll just get converted into offices so they're also yeah, made it in a way i so i've been to the venice biennale for the last ones except for the one that was during the pandemic because it was going to be very small and they only did it the very last minute were so you there i thought it was 2018 not, i was in 2018 i don't think i was been there very, yeah i was very disappointed i took my students to 2018 and 2016 2016 was amazing. 2014 was done by OMA, so I was there with OMA. We were partying with OMA. It was fantastic. 2016 with that arena was mind blowing. 2018, uh, I was very disappointed. People were My telling students. me that 2018 is not good, but because I had never seen anything like it, I was just excited to to just go and explore the space. I'd also been to Venice for the first time, so it was just exciting in that sense also. Um, yeah. But a lot of people were telling me like this this Biennale this year is not uh, that great. I'll tell you why. Uh, my perspective was, you know, every time that there's a Venice Biennale, they a, a hire or nominate a curator or curate curators. You know, in this ca- case, was a pair, a couple, um, and they need to set up a theme. Yeah. That it's going to be. That's what it's going to be about. So that's what we're going to be talking. And the theme for them was very vague. It was free space. Yeah, and yeah, I remember. I saw I, you. Anybody listening, you can go into YouTube and find the press conference for each one of the binales. It's an hour-long press conference where the uh, the the curators tell you what the show is going to be about. And I listened to it for an hour, an hour plus, and could still not understand what it was about. So imagine all the architects that had to work for the exhibitions in the pavilions. They had to come up with an exhibition that attached itself to that topic, and when it's so vague. it's just not going to be very strong and i think that was the issue it's not strong true i think yeah uh i i especially remember the british pavilion in in 2018 and the, the which top. yeah and the whole the inside of the pavilion was empty yeah. and um i remember me and my friends were laughing like what like we can be curators <laughs> Well, but that was smart because it was free space. What's free? Well, the, the rooftop, and then they would serve you like British tea, right? Yeah. And cook. <laughs> um, what one interesting case because we're going this summer, and it's going to be the Art Biennale. The Art Biennale is way bigger than the Architecture Biennale, but it's about art, not architecture. So in that case, you have Documenta, which is every five years, and you have the Venice Art Biennale. But when you go to Venice, when you go to see the National Pavilions, they're still standing there. So it doesn't matter if it's art or architecture. The design of those buildings are done by, you know, important architects in their times. So you've got the Venezuela Pavilion that's been closed for the last six years by Carlos Carpa, the very well-known um, Italian architect. And last time I was there for 2018, it was closed, just like 2016, 2014. But there was a sign that said that they were devoting money instead of creating a, an exhibition that takes money to come up with. They're using that money to restore it because it's in very bad uh, sure. uh, conditions. Yeah. Well, but if you have sort of uh, uh, made me think of sort of going this year also, but if I don't go this year, let's meet next year in, at the. Of course. Just one more thing about these exhibitions. Usually, uh, when you have a World Expo or when you have, there was one thing called the Forum of the Cultures. They they usually take a part of the of the, of the city. and they design all these uh buildings that are pavilions or other sort of infrastructure and there's a party of the expo for several months and after that as you said they become office building and cultural centers and such and such and that's interesting because you regenerate or you create a part of the city very quickly yeah and as we know 
the grounds for the Biennale are always the same. You have two sites. You have the Giardini, where you have the national pavilions that are standing there. The newest one is the one from Australia. And then you have the Arsenale, which is an old Venetian building. By the way, I was a part of... So the Turkish pavilion was uh, in the Arsenale. And yeah. I was a... So they, they had this thing. They were bringing in students from all over the world uh, for a, in, in batches of one week and making the exhibit. So I was a part of their one of the weeks and we had created an exhibit inside the pavilion. Nice. Yeah, there's a program for these things, right? Uh, but the thing they started doing from a couple of years now in Venice is they do the collateral uh, events or collateral exhibitions. If you were there in 2018 and you saw the uh, Vatican pavilions, there was this other island yeah. where they, they had never been pavilions there before and they did 16 amazing pavilions. One was by Norman Foster. I think the, the, the Golden Lion Award for the best pavilion went for one of those. I forget the name of the island. And they do, if you really want to see the Venice Biennale in the whole, it takes you like five weeks because you see this map that has these two big sites, but then there's 50 other satellite sites with small installations, which sometimes can be very bad or boring, but it takes the whole, the whole collection of islands that is Venice. Ah, I think we had mostly, because again, because of the exhibit, we had mostly just spent our time within the, the Turkish pavilion space. And then one day we had went to Giardini and one day we had gone to the other, uh, yeah. And, but yeah, we had, we, we were also seeing in other, other places, there were art installations at other places that we did not even know of. And we were just in the main square of Venice at night. So we would just course. hang out there and, and. Beautiful. That's yeah. the living room of Europe, Rishabh. <laughs> there were also oh. we also took a boat the ferry to to another place which where we found it was a space just filled with college kids yeah. uh and it was because all of them were our age and so uh there were loads of pubs and clubs there uh so everybody and it was weird to me that people because you i've never seen you take the drink and you go outside and you sit and you're uh chilling with other people and and i was like we take the glasses as well they're like yeah bring it back when you're done <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a different different thing you've got the university of venice there of course with it has an entrance by carlos carpa as well no no venice is amazing there's some good sides of it there's some bad sides of it i mean nobody lives in venice people live there for six months out of the year it lives because of the tourism it dies because of the tourism it's sinking yeah. there's many issues there's many issues around when the When we Binales. were leaving, they were sort of preparing those floats that people would walk on after uh, Aqua. the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you guys can look up the Vice documentary on the on the Venice Art Biennale. It's really interesting to see the uh, work behind the coming up of the Biennale. It's 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 hard hitting documentary. All right. So um, yeah, let's quickly come to our main topics for the day. Uh, the very first one that we'll discuss it's, is Pritzker 2022. So which went to uh, the Abedo Francis Kere. And I'll be honest, I did not know of his work before the Pritzker Prize was announced. And I did most of my research after it was announced for the video that I did create. Did you know of his work before? Yeah, I got to see him in Mexico actually. And so I saw the school, uh, the Gando school. Um, early in the 2000s and I got to know him also before he came to Mexico through the Aga Khan Award uh, because I was working at Search Architects in Holland in, in the Netherlands and Search won the Aga Khan for a, a the Dutch embassy in Ethiopia and that's the first time I heard about the Aga Khan Award which is sort of like the Pritzker Award but it's giving to a building or a few buildings depending on their typology yeah. Uh, every yeah. two years, not every year. So the Icon Award is a very prestigious award, but it's not giving to a person or an office for their amount of work. It's per billing. Um, so yeah, amazing work. What yeah. do you think about it? So I was I was really moved by uh, obviously his work is is ingenious in what he does, but I was really moved by his his philosophies and his motives behind his work because a lot of his work and he even built before he became an architect. Like the, the Gando school was built before he became an architect. And it was with that notion of, of giving back to his community, He's so deep rooted within his community. Uh, and he, he, even Gando school came out of his own experiences uh, as a child in those classrooms, understanding 
you know uh, what went wrong where and then using all of that memory that he had and creating something uh, that that could solve problem it goes back to that definition of architects uh, people who who solve problems uh, which i thought was ingenious and a lot of people loved uh, this year's prize especially because of that i think is uh, it wasn't a star architect this time or somebody who was who was really flashy who who creates aesthetics and who creates aesthetic and and beautiful designs but a lot those designs might not have as much meaning but here it yeah. was no no i I've, i've got several opinions there um well yeah he definitely built in 2001 that school before he graduated in berlin but he he had studied becoming an a, a carpenter so yeah. if you look at his buildings you can see a person that knows how things are put together you know you can see the details and because if you know how things are put together then you can spend a lot of time thinking what is the cheapest and best way to put this thing together so there's a very smart allocation of resources both material wise and um and labor wise and so in that sense it's it's beautiful work not only in its aesthetics but it's in its functionality and its thoughtfulness it's very thoughtful now as to the award because there's there's several architects doing i mean there's many architects all over the world many that are unknown that are doing this kind of work but i think the pritzker prize is very important because it sends sort of a, a barometer it sends a bit of a, a a direction of what is being valued in the culture right now and i think this is a returning of a few values that we had seen lost in the pritzker if we see the last years you know like atone masal um we see a, a bit more of an interest of focusing on or promoting architects that are doing work that has a, a strong social interest um and architecture not only for you know high end uh, art uh, high end clients etc and so it's a returning of the values of community you said it yourself the word community is very important here now because of all of that i think it's that's all very good and well i'm curious because there is an effect of this award things happen to architects after this award so what happens when we start going to see buildings of francis queret in other parts of the world where you don't have the conditions that he had there in burkina faso where you know scarce water scarce labor yeah. uneducated labor all these things how will his architecture change to that different site if we see frank gary it's a very interesting thing if you look at the pritzker uh, website for frank gary he was given the award in 1989 and if you go to his page within the pritzker prize it says selected works and they put the guggenheim museum no 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 sorry guggenheim museum in bilbao was in the 2000s so he was awarded for a very different type of work and then post pritzker what you see is a complete radical change now changes in artists is good so if you have like corbusier you have the the brutalist phase and the rational phase and if you look at picasso you have the blue phase and all these things however i'm very curious to see what's going to happen um post pritzker in like 5 10 years to francis querer's work well that would be that um i never thought about this before that that that's a pritzker prize also uh change because i know and by the way somebody is asking is this live yes this is live guys we were chatting right in front of you all right so um so uh, also if you have any question comments about anything that we're discussing just uh, put them down here and and we will also discuss it with you guys but yep. uh, i i remember when i was making the frank gary's documentary and this was something that was very interesting to me and that is what i started off with that we know frank gary as what, with what he does today but that is not what he started with like his no. buildings were like regular buildings that you might just see i might see one in jaipur uh, it it was very similar of of what he started off with and then slowly he just i think he also you could see that progression of slowly doing something doing something doing something and then going into uh, what he uh, really does today no oh, there's a clear evolution there's a clear line i think for me i'm not a i'm not a student of his work i'm i'm a fan of his work i'm a fan of him i think he's a hero uh in a, in a certain respect in a certain area right i think francis gade in his own right is also a great hero uh and what he's doing and has accomplished but it, i think the vitra building for gary 
in the Vitra Campus. I think that's a center point of the pre-Gary and the post-Gary. Because uh, you, you can see him, him there starting to try to work curves. And then that's where the software comes in. That's where he starts using Katia, sort of aeronautical uh, 3D software for doing architecture. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the, the line is clear, but there's definitely a pre and a post. And that happens with, with many artists. So I'm just curious, what is the post going to be then? Yeah, it'll be, it'll be something to watch. Um, yeah, start seeing renderings already from Kere's work of some large buildings in other parts of the world. So, yeah, that are coming up. Yeah, exactly. Even in, in the Pritzker, so within the Pritzker Prize, there were some buildings that were already built. There were also in selected works, there were renderings of what is to come uh, in, in those other places as well. And again, it was all rooted from his uh, his own culture where, where even, um, I don't remember, it was a government complex that he was creating and, he, and the center of it would still be a tree, uh, which uh, is sort of the custom in his village where people gather around that tree, sit near that tree. And that tree became like the central thing within the whole space, this whole plaza, an indoor plaza that he created. And, and it, everything sort of comes out from there. I mean, that's Socrates, right? It's the idea of the tree, the agora, and the shade, and that's where the school is. It's where the shade of the tree is, where you sit down and, and, and talk, right? So it's all very poetic and very beautiful. Um, but remember, I think these awards tell us more about the jury than the awardee or the laureate, let's say. I think it's about what is a jury looking at? And I think it's a very well-needed focus of changing of values, of taking care of society, community, smart allocation of resources, and thinking about the environment. And, and you know, these things are very important. And for many years, the Pritzker did not represent those values. It represented other things that were a bit more academic, a bit more about pushing the boundaries of what design is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a diff it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's just the times. Yeah. Uh, just give me a minute. There's water flowing outside. It's wasting. I'll quickly go turn it off. Yeah. Speaking about smart allocation of resources. I wish I could see the questions, but I have to wait for Rishab to tell me what the questions are. Yeah. All right. We're okay. Back. Yes. Okay. Let's come to our main topic of the day, uh, which is about unfair practices within uh, the field of architecture. And this is mostly in terms of uh, employment. And I had, I had sort of written um, some down so that we could discuss them uh, one by one. But I wanted to start off with something that is very general that a lot of people talk about. Uh, is the low salaries within the field of architecture. Um, especially when you start, it takes, it takes a while for you to, to come to a stage where you can comfortably have a good lifestyle with doing architecture. Uh, I know we also touched upon this when we, were dis when we had our first interview and you were discussing life at OMA. And uh, so uh, could you talk a little bit about that. Why do you think uh, the the frustration that comes out uh, of people is architecture as an uh, to study architecture, it takes a lot of investment, uh, both in terms of time and money. It is like in India, it takes five years to just get a bachelor's degree in architecture. Um, and uh, even when you graduate and architecture courses are one of the most expensive ones uh, compared to a lot of other courses out there. And even when you graduate, you graduate from one of the top institutes in the world and you still, uh, the salaries are quite low. It takes years for, for people to, to sort of achieve that. So uh, why do you think that is? Well, why that is, I can't tell you, but I can speak about how to deal with it, which I think is, is, is important. Uh, first of all, I think the only way to really discuss this is in this sort of long format, unedited way, because there's a lot of nuance to this topic. And it's a, it can be an incendiary topic. So we need to be 
uh, precise in what we say and how we say it. Let me tell you, um, there's many problems with this topic, but there's also many justifications for it. And there's also a part of it where you have to say, well, these are the facts of life. So you need to be able to understand it first and then do something about it. There's no point in, in just seeing the conditions of the working environment and then just you know creating a blog post about it and then not doing anything about it. Yeah. You, do you understand what I mean? And we say in Spanish, tomar cartas en asunto, which means write letters about it, right? It's okay. Do more than just write letters. So I never worked for no payment, let's say. And I would have never, even when I was haven't graduated yet, I never took a part-time job or a internship or summer job where I was not going to be paid. And I would never advise anybody to do so. Uh, and I've never hired anybody in my studio that has not been paid, okay? I think we have to start off there. Secondary, and you tell me how much time we have for this, because again, this is a long discussion. Secondary, we have to define what is a job and what is not a job, because unfortunately, internships are not formal jobs. Internships yeah. are before yeah. you get a job, because an internship can only mean you have not graduated yet. You don't have your title. Now, that's also an issue because some people take internships with master's degree already graduated exactly. as a master's. Yeah. That should never happen. Um, now, I can understand two things that A, you really want to work for that firm and there's only internships available. So then you take a pay cut and decide to go there. That's your decision. But you, then you're not helping the situation by doing that. Now, I've been in discussions at OMA where people wanted to do that and they said sorry no you're overqualified for this position we're looking for year out candidates you have a master's this is not a position for you because we understood that even though there was a great there were a great candidate a great person a great element for the team that eventually if you're hired for an internship when you're overqualified you're going to be working very hard for not that much compensation and eventually it's not a good environment to be in because yeah. you don't feel compensated yeah. right uh, so never do that. And offices should not put overqualified people in lower positions. Yeah. Then we have to understand what the internship is. Then it's for people who don't have a title that are still studying and they're meant to be going for an experience and then go back to school. Um, I see sometimes in some places, especially in the US, where certain studios take advantage of a legal loophole especially with foreign students. So you get foreign students that go to the USA yeah. and are studying at very good schools where they're very good instructors and very good professors. Sometimes one professor has four instructors around him that help them give his class. So he or she goes to the semester class once or maybe three times and the rest of the semester you're with the instructors, with the tutors. And the tutors have their own studios as well and are very successful and very good uh, instructors. So then you might be uh, enticed to then work for them. If you're a foreign student, your visa does not allow you to work. work yeah. You're not allowed to receive payments. And so there, that creates, unfortunately, a sort of vicious cycle there where, okay, you want to work for these people, but they're not allowed to pay you. And that is problematic, of course. Yeah. Why is that problematic yeah. if they're following the law and you agree to not get paid because you're following the law of your uh, your visa status. Well, the problem is because then local students are not going to get hired because you do, would have to pay a local student, a citizen of that country that is allowed to work. And so local students are overstepped by very good foreign students that are are not legally allowed to be paid. Yeah. That's a huge. Yeah. I mean, also talking touching upon this subject of internship there also i just saw a post like somebody uh on somebody's story and it's true a lot of offices uh, especially the smaller ones that come up you would see they hire a lot of interns uh and not as many employees because you know you have to pay less to interns and the office is just filled so i i think that post was if you see an office where there are loads of interns more than the number of employees you usually just go out of that office well, uh, yes, but then let's talk about compensation. So 
compensation, especially in internships, and I would say junior architect positions. So the latter that I'm used to, and these kind of offices that I worked in, both in South America, Europe, and Asia, all follow this same sort of strata. You have intern, it's a person that has not graduated. You have a junior architect, person that has just graduated, it has to up to two years experience. An architect, somebody with more than two year experience working on a project. A senior architect, somebody that can lead uh, a team. Associate, somebody that is invested in the office. So they're part of a, a partner in a project. And then a partner, somebody who's part owner of the company, yeah? So I would say that for internships and for junior architects, your compensation will not only be monetary and you need to be very well aware of this. So you need to have an idea of where do you wanna go? Because your idea is not to stay as an intern for the rest of your life. It's a stepping stone. It's gonna be a short one. It's gonna feel very long because <laughs> it's hard work, yeah. but it's a stepping stone. Stepping stone to where? So. If you want to, at some point, create your own studio, uh, a good idea is to work for a studio that does the work, the type that you would like to do one day. So, oh, I would like to do work that has to do with community and social. Well, you should look at studios that are doing that kind of work, yeah? Or I want to do X type of master planning. Or I want to do something that has to do with the environment. Yeah. Look at those studios and then try to work for those studios as experience, right? Then part of your salary is going to be your CV for having worked at that space. But if I work at a boutique, uh, let's say Pritzker winning firm, when my idea is to start a construction firm in Mexico, yeah. nobody's going to care of my hours spent at this Pritzker Prize company because it doesn't matter. I should know more about administration and construction. True. And so... True. But if I do want to create a boutique office like that, then the CV really matters. And that's where the portfolio of me having worked there on certain projects in certain phases becomes a monetized portfolio. Uh, I'll give you a very quick story. When I was leaving OMA, I found out of a company, a very well-established company that had gone bankrupt and was resurfacing, was contacting a lot of people because a few friends got contacted when they were saying, hey guys, we have a portfolio of about 600 built projects. If you guys have a project, just add your name to our name, let's say famous company plus Viviano and submit our portfolio as experience for your new project and we'll help you with it and we become partners. So they were basically looking for uh, satellite associates. It was a very interesting way of finding out that the portfolio is money. It's money in potential, right? Yeah. which a new person in this field does not have that built portfolio. So if you can attach it to the name of an existing company, it gives you a lot of credence and you can probably grab that project and do it and then give some money, of course, some sharing to this famous company that helped you got it. So not everything is cash, right? And we have to understand that because some people go and sacrifice themselves for these Pritzker winning firms or award winning firms that the pay is not great because a lot of it is compensation and experience and then they cannot use that experience. So then they get dissatisfied. And I understand that, yeah. but that's yeah. a lack of perspective before going there. So, but um, I think then it also, it might also, the frustration also might come from the fact that, uh, see, you, you're paid more because when you get experienced, right? When you have worked on projects and then, so the frustration also comes from the fact that then is the education that they got within the school is that not as important or should it not be that long or should people be working all throughout uh, and it should be a proper part of the education itself if what really matters is the experience and not uh, your your academic skills should then the experience be a, a, a full-fledged part of the the system the education system that is a, a great topic. That's actually the topic of my thesis, of my master's thesis. In Argentina, it takes six years to graduate and to, from your bachelor, but you get a title that is called architect and urbanist. So you're both architect and an urbanist with, these, with this extra year. But that's the only title you can get in Argentina. I do think that uh, in 2022, the idea that it takes five years in Mexico, the same as in India, in some places in Europe, it takes three years. That's much better. But for it to take five years of schooling, of very expensive schooling, 
where you have very little time to work and gain money is extraordinarily long. Yeah. I don't see any justification for a bachelor taking more than three years. And even Definitely. post that five years, you're still told that you don't know anything about, uh, you know, the field itself. So you need to now keep working at lower wages so that you gain experience so that you can then get hired for higher salaries. But this is true. So if you are in a five year program, you should, by the time you graduate, have had at least one year of part time experience, because if you don't, then you then it's true. You don't know anything about the real working environment. So you're going to have to start from zero in that first internship. This is why the year out student is really important in, in the sort of academic model. That is three years in school, one year doing an internship and then your fifth year back in school. Yeah. So by the time you graduate, you have that experience. You've had your internship. Now you're a junior architect and you know something about the real working environment and you have some money and not only in debt, you know? Yeah, true. Um, you know, one more thing that people are sort of a little frustrated about is uh, work hours. Is the uh, the work hours are insane in in architect school, and I think a lot of because a lot of offices uh, maintain that studio culture, uh, where you know when you are in a, a studio in 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 college, uh, there is no sense of time. You're constantly working. I understand that when you're younger and I understand that when you're in college, you're in an education setting and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a completely different environment then. But when, when you're out working and this goes, uh, why this has become a greater deal is because architecture is not the only profession in the world. There are many. There are many professions that have gone formalization where, where there are work hours which, which, which people are there to. Because as you grow up in life, you do not just want to just work you want to have a life beyond work which becomes yeah. uh, not as much possible when you're constantly working constantly uh, given being projects late nights i think sometimes um you know you need to take care of your health but i, I think sometimes um we fall prey of the culture of stress the culture of dissatisfaction and the culture that we're being mistreated. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I would say don't focus on that. You know, there's quite a few blogs that I follow that, you know, we use the word toxic a lot nowadays that are really toxic. They don't help. You have to remember that design comes from a place of love. You cannot design a house for someone that you hate. You know, you have to design from a place of love. So all these issues are true. But I had a girlfriend who was a lawyer and I had a girlfriend who was a doctor and they have the same hours. They also wanted life. So you're working on a project, which this happened to us. And well, I was at OMA and we, you have a meeting with the mayor who's paying for the project and decides that he wants to change a few things and he wants to see it by next week. Do you think that you're going to say, oh, sorry, I'm going to clock out at six? No. <laughs> You have to update the project for whatever the mayor wants, otherwise the project is canceled. Now the issue is that when this happens, that your extra hours should be paid for. Yeah. And I know of several companies where extra hours are paid for. In my particular time at OMA, uh, there was an agreement that these extra hours are compensated. What does that mean? And it, it meant that uh, if you um, overworked several hours, then those are given to you as office leave. It's not actually a financial payment, but it's free time. It's vac it's paid vacation. Okay. You're not in the office okay. and you're being paid. So it's, it's being paid forward, right? Okay. In the future, not in that moment, in that month as extra hours. But there's a lot of corporate companies in the US who I know they, they pay extra hour. If it's on a weekend, it's 1.5 1, 1. times, 1.5 X. And if it's on a holiday, it's 2 X. So it does exist. You just need to not accept uh, contracts where that's not stipulated or where that's not being the case. But then like tying into your, your first point where you where you also said, you know, when you are also working for Pritzker winning boutique places uh, that are just on, on the on the start only not even uh, you might not even getting a good enough salary when you start off. Uh, yeah. th there might also be cases where you are not even, uh, so you won't be compensated for that extra time, but you would be also 
expected to do so. Uh, this was one of my friends when he was doing his internship. And uh, obviously, interns are usually never compensated for their extra time in, in, in most of the places. So, but there was this thing, as soon as the thing, uh, so at the office, his office used to be till like 7. And as soon yeah. as it was 7, he would usually get up. And because he was also used to ask his supervisors always uh, that, you know, can this be submitted tomorrow? They said yes. And the other interns used to ask him, like, how do you leave? He said, I ask. <laughs> <laughs> and they said okay but then he's uh, one day when his principal architect was sort of talking to him the principal architect also to- said it to his face like the other interns stay back they work you don't uh, and and it, it it just he always finished his work uh, but it just seemed unfair that you were expected to do that you're not compensated to do that uh, I understand as interns but also as employees now uh, so yeah. I mean, look, there was people that would leave their sweater on their chair so that it looked like they're still there. Oh, they just went out to dinner and they're going to come back and then they would not come back. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's corporate appearances. That's I mean, that sometimes has a little bit to do. There's many reasons, but that, it has a little bit of psychological issues. If you feel that you're in the team, but that you're not perhaps the the. Uh, uh, that you're not providing as much value, then you feel that you need to be always there. The people that are usually comfortable of what their work means for the team or for the studio, they know like, look, this is this can be done tomorrow. I don't need to stay and I'll do it tomorrow. But there's also moments where like, look, the deadline is tomorrow. So I need, I'm gonna have to stay tonight. And so having a little bit of, you know, criteria is what we call it, criterio in Spanish, of when to and when not to is really important. And actually, you can ask your project leader or your boss, can I leave? And if they say no, but if it goes against your criteria, like, no, yeah, this can be done definitely tomorrow. Why should I stay? You can have that discussion. It's when people don't talk about it and people feel like, oh, I should stay, otherwise I'm going to get fired. I never met anybody who, because they left, got fired, you know? Yeah. I will tell you something. It is expected. And they're going to look at promoting the people that did stay. Yeah, Perhaps exactly. Your contract will not get renewed because then they say, well, this person is not a, a team player, let's yeah. say. Yeah, there was, there was this there was this really viral video in India. It was a comedy sketch. And those were not architects, but basically pe- in, engineers who worked in some firm. It was a skit that they did. But as soon as, so it was the time it was done, the office hours, he got up from his chair, put his bag on and he was leaving. And the other person turns around to him and says, oh, you're doing a half day today. And then he just, <laughs> he just started, it was a whole monologue of all his frustration coming out on that person. But basically he was like, what half day? This is what you're paid for. This is the entire day, even if they compensate you for beyond that. So what yeah. you are saying, I understand uh, doing that, you know, project to project, it depends. You know, when c- certain times there are deadlines, there are certain times that you have to stay over. But it then also just feels like if you're constantly staying over, constantly uh, uh, just being expected to to uh, to give in more than you're compensated for, it just seems that the office is just uh, either they're not good at management, the people who are hiring you, because clearly you need another person to do the job. Uh, if if well, yeah. all of your employees are overstressed. Yeah. You can be, you could have an understaffed team, and that was an issue. Sometimes we would say that we need more people, right, uh, for this project. This project ha- has a lot of work, and we can't handle it with six or seven people. We need more, or we need more support. That's for sure. And your the managers need to do staff allocations and resource allocations. And you know, in the end of the day, everything comes down to hours. Uh, the people in management take in a project, they quote it, uh, and they say, we're going to take this many hours of these many juniors, this many architects, this many seniors, so it's going to cost us this much, hence we're going to charge this much. And then they need to make sure that they don't overrun those hours because it yeah. happens. Because I'll tell you, how long does it take to come up with a great design for a floor plan for a house? Well, it can take years if you want to re- rethink it and rethink it. A person it, so. was doing it for 35 years, by the way. He was building his... <laughs> what was this? He was, Who is this? He was, there's this guy in Texas and he was building a, something for himself. So every, yeah. every few months he used to just add on something, change something. And so it, for 35 years, he just kept building it and changing it. You can endlessly well, get you know. stuck in doing that. 
he, somebody owes him a lot of extra hours then it was his own house and that is why so he could do it <laughs> no but uh it should not be the norm it, it doesn't mean it should not happen it should not be the normal condition yeah i agree okay um so i want to quickly also uh, go towards our audience's questions because it's already been an hour uh, but you know uh, to to sort it of fast. yeah yeah it it, it it does <laughs> All right. So while talking about unfair labor practices, please also talk about the ones with fair practices and good work, yep. so that we have exactly. a, a direction to study practices. Uh, so yeah, what would be then fair practices? And well, I I was very happy with all the conditions I was in. So I'll I'll, I'll tell you the the three uh, jobs that I had as internships and juniors in South America. I worked for a program that was with my school. So I submitted my portfolio to my school and it's sort of it's a competition between portfolios and they would select 10 portfolios every year. And then you get awarded first to set to 10th place and first place chooses the office they want to work at first, second, second, third and so on. And I got sixth place in that, let's say, a competition. I was in my third year and was competing against five fifth year students. And I got to choose and I chose Santiago de Chile. And because this was through the school, the school told you that you would pay tuition to the school, but you would get working experience. So there was no payment from the studio. But because the studio is a great studio, they said, well, you'll get a honorary payment at the end of your internship. And they did. They pay me that. And that was great. I, I was really happy with that. Now, I understand that not many people uh, can afford to do that. You need some support for that yeah. because you're not living yeah. then in your parents' house, you're living abroad. And you, but it's basically being in school, but instead of being in school, you're in the office, you see? And I did get a compensation at the end. Then the other one was in Holland in search. And there my payment was exactly the same as my rent. So then I had to get some financial support for expenses and food basically. But I was happy with at least my housing being covered you know that was a for me at the time this as was an intern oh this wasn't in, as an intern i had not graduated yet yes okay so that was my second internship and then after that as a as a junior architect at oma uh, my um let's say my goal was that for my salary to pay at least uh, 50 percent of my uh rent and that's what happened now, financial advisor will say 30%, but I think on a good internship, let's say at a good studio, sorry, I shouldn't say the word good, at the type of studio that I wanted, I would never get more than that for a junior uh, position. If you go to more corporate environment, the kind of places where they have like summer summer uh, bonding and you have, uh, let's say, uh, you have to submit a lot of like, HR forms at the end of the month and have a lot of like meetings of how you're doing and how's your team doing that kind of stuff with projects that are not necessarily design competitions or projects that are more design build, let's say, of course you would get more and could reach that 30%. Financial advisors will tell you uh, at your, your, um, your rent should be 30% of your paycheck, let's say. So I got to 50% and I was happy with that. And the extra hours there were being paid as a compensation, as, a, as I mentioned. So those were my three gigs that I consider good practices. All right. Um, any advices for upcoming architects? We did. So for this also, I would just say you go back to the very first conversation we have because Viviano gave a lot of advices towards the end of the video um, uh, and it ranged like from, from student to, to your career. So it, there was a lot of it, but if you want to add, like give some more. Yeah, I mean, like you say, it's a very open and vague question, but I would say definitely what you get taught in school is part of it. The other part is gonna be working. So definitely always try to work. Uh, you I should work for also three... talk about reforms in the education system itself, like yep. uh, to, to, to make it uh, even better and because also uh, there was this talk going on, like especially in the US, uh, student debt is, is off the roof. Uh, and again, yeah. And architecture schools, again, are one of the most expensive ones to, to go through. And uh, again, you go through, go to these great institutions and you still take years to pay off. 
that debt which is again because the the education system is not can be designed in a way that it gives you more experience so that you're more hireable once you're out uh, uh yeah but it depends the thing is that for example let's say the hardcore design programs in the US if you graduate from one of those and then you want to work for a corporate company they are not interested in your CV because you know nothing about construction documents yeah so if they yeah. hire you if they like your profile you're going to have to learn a lot so they're going to pay you a very low wage so a lot of perspective and a lot of figuring out what the issue is post educational life is very important so i would say always work because that helps you uh to start learning these things I worked for 3 years and part times in in my 5 year bachelor. Um I think that's very important. I think also no matter where you're studying, what you're being taught is only half of it. You have to keep doing things like these, these kind of discussions. All the videos that you post, Rishab, are very very um illuminating in many topics. But reading Why do our people... wear black? <laughs> Why <laughs> Why do our we're both wearing black? Right? Yeah. <laughs> reading. So you need to start uh creating your your library of books both physically and mentally your references i think that's very important tomorrow i'm actually giving a a pro bono lecture for people in myanmar uh because over there the schools have been closed so the title of that lecture is how to continue education when you cannot access formal education i'm going to give yeah. a lot of tips of how you can keep doing exercises and studying and and free resources out there in the internet that can help you when you're not not able to afford or not able to access formal education and that's all freely available on the internet the internet is an amazing resource if if used correctly for sure um so uh will this live be on the channel to watch later yes so it will go up on the channel as a regular video then there's something i think in spanish which i can't read um oh can you text it to me and i can read it wait let me There's an X D at the end, so I think it's a joke, but I don't know. <laughs> Probably that that makes sense. No, wait, what did I send you? There we go. Oh, you sent me? No, yeah, that's a link. Uh, there you go. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, he's saying that uh, he's sure that I know how to speak the native one of the native tongues of Mexico, which is Nahuatl. uh but he also knows english so uh, that's a that's just a joke on oh. how good my english is i guess oh in the middle español pero no sé now what i don't know now what unfortunately in india you guys have uh, what 80 official languages there are loads uh i think <laughs> there are loads i think how many yeah, do you yeah. speak how many do i speak yeah um I personally like properly only speak two which is Hindi and English but I can understand Sindhi which is my mother tongue and yeah. uh I can understand a bit of of Punjabi and the the uh Marwadi which is Rajasthan Marathi when you say Indian is that Marathi or is that another one uh which one Marathi is that the when you said Mar- Indian but no no I didn't say Indian uh oh Hindi English English and Indian that's no, no. what you said Hindi and English Oh Hindi okay. Yeah. Okay. So Hindi is the official language but there's dialects like Marathi and and Sindhi and all these, no? Yeah. So I, but they're also a little different from Hindi. They're not really Hindi Hindi. And so uh and Hindi is most mostly in like the north of India. As you go towards the south of India, you'll find lots of people who can't speak in Hindi. And then they either communicate with you in English or they uh, they speak in the southern languages and you try to guess what they say. I still need to make it up to the north of India to go to the Ladakh and then to then Bangladesh as well. See the assembly building. I saw uh, sorry we're getting off topic here but I saw a very interesting post no article uh I think it was the Financial Times of all the chairs the Le Corbusier chairs that were being thrown out from the assembly buildings in in um uh, in Chandigarh and people then just bought them for like $5 a piece. and they sold them in galleries for like i can imagine 2, 000, yeah like thousand dollars insane yeah because i i think a lot of times here people don't um, realize the value that a lot of things around us hold and yeah, yeah that's that's true 
all right uh so we have just five more minutes so uh one is is the profession undercompensated globally uh i i i couldn't say i think i think design it's a, offices it's yes, a struggle I especially was. in your early years no that of course but for design offices yes because if you want to go into construction administration you're going to earn good money yeah so design oriented boutique office that is very very uh sacrificed yes uh would you recommend applying as a junior architect at omi <laughs> of course um it's not for everyone yeah it depends uh, on what your goals are exactly like i said need to plan your because career. i remember you from your conversation also and when we had come to the last part where i asked you why did you finally decide to leave omi and he said because that was the plan that was uh, mm-hmm. w- what i came here to do is to learn everything that i could and then go back and start my own firm i thought i was going to stay there for 2 years i ended up staying a little bit over 5 yeah. uh, because i really enjoyed it so and the work was really interesting and i had good friends in the office and and outside of the office and that kept me there so look uh, my best advice would, would be look at profiles of people that you would like to emulate you see that person yeah i would like to be in that position i would like to be doing their work uh, or have their life you know not everything is about having your own studio and your own um your work There, there's very fulfilling lives of collaborating in teams or working for different offices or on the on the academic side on the teaching side the pedagogy side i do both and honestly i wouldn't be able to tell you which one i like most uh being with my students or being with my team in the office i really love them both yeah all right um let's go through one last question uh uh okay uh i mean we've talked about this on the channel a lot we i and i've talked about this to a lot of people uh but let's discuss it one more time should we apply to big firms or small offices uh okay i can tell you what I, the differences can 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 come into play um i would say in a smaller practice you're going to be able to get to know the leadership of the practice a lot better and a smaller practice for me would be anything under 60 people 60 in total the whole organization it, if you say oh i'm applying at big and the big office in new york has 60 people no big globally has Lord. quite a few more people than that right so i'm saying in total you'll be able to establish a relationship with the leadership if you're an intern that relationship can then mean um uh, future employment with them as well it can mean future references like let's say reference letters and these kind of things and i think that's interesting as to design wise in a smaller outfit probably the design is a lot more controlled by the leadership themselves so it's not exactly like that but the the caricature would be you're going to be handed a, a paper with a sketch on it and then you have to interpret that and you do that you're not designing yourself then again when you're in a competition because times are so short then there really if it's a good office your opinion as an intern is as valid as a senior architect and everybody is discussing around the table and all ideas are equally hierarchically valued and the best idea wins so you can get your design in there in a larger outfit uh, a larger more corporate office let's say that has 1000 employees then the design is going to be controlled by your design leader so who your project leader is within your small unit and you might not ever meet the leadership of this company uh so that's different and it depends then who are you going to be working under so if you're going to be interviewed for a large office you want to know on what project you want to know this for a small project as well uh so a small office you want to know what project you're going to be working on for the next year why you're being hired for which team and who leads that team that's very important because then you know well okay is so and so going to give me design tasks where am i and am i am i going to just be doing models or 3d models for the whole internship so those are the two sort of like uh parameters for me looking at small versus big they're equally uh, good i wouldn't say go this way or go that way it depends what you want it depends also on your opportunities sometimes there's places where there's just no big offices and it's dominated by small offices the majority of offices are big uh, sorry are small 80% of offices are small true um all right so um i think yeah that is all we had time for 
you know, Viviano, thank you so much for coming uh, to the channel for the Blessed Dark Lounge. Whenever I start something new, I feel like I start with you. So, uh, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Rishab, it's an honor always speaking to you and please keep up all the videos. I'm excited to see uh, the Blessed Arch Lounge, where it's going to go, who's going to be next. Yeah. I know you have things yeah. planned, so it sounds all very exciting. This is going to be in the channel, right? Yeah. It's going to remain okay. in the channel, yes. Awesome. So if there's people that see this afterwards, you can write down the comments in the video and I can, I can respond to them afterwards. Perfect. All right, so thank you, Vivano. Thank you, everybody who is watching, uh, who came on this live uh, throughout. You, obviously, you can watch it back later. And uh, yeah, it was a great conversation today. And more of such conversation coming up soon. I'll, I'll let you know as soon uh, whenever the next Blessed Out uh, Lounge episode is coming up.